Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about screen printing. This is a well-known process for transferring graphics onto a variety of different substrates, and so you'd think there would be a lot of great info on the web about getting started, perhaps even a kit of all the equipment you need to do this. Uh, but surprisingly, there is almost no information available for printing stuff other than t-shirts. And so in this video, I'm going to describe all the equipment that I used after trying a bunch of different things, and you'll be able to save a lot of time if you want to get into this. Okay, so the basic process goes like this. We take uh, an empty screen and coat it with a chemical that is photosensitive and let it dry. And then we take a transparent or translucent printout from an ordinary desktop printer and put it in good contact with the layer, with the photosensitive layer and shine light on it. And wherever light goes through the transparency and hits the photosensitive layer, it will become insoluble in water. And all the areas that were kept dark will be soluble in water. So after the exposure is over, we take this to uh, an ordinary uh, sink. Just plain water will rinse away the photosensitive layer where we don't want it. So then we're left with a screen that is patterned and there's open areas wherever we had uh, a dark area in the printout. Uh, then we suspend this above the object we want to print and squeeze ink through all those open areas. Pretty straightforward, but um, going to the moon is also pretty straightforward if you just say we blast off and then we land. It's really the details that determine whether a process is tricky or not. And so let's step through the process uh, kind of sequentially and I'll point out all the different choices you have and all the best things you should buy for high resolution screen printing on uh, substrates like metal and glass. Let's start off by talking about the screen itself. If you're like me, you're probably pretty concerned with getting the highest resolution possible. And when you start searching for screens, you'll notice that the uh, thread counts are one of the main parameters there. So this is a 160 screen. It has 160 openings per inch. And this is a 350 screen, 350 openings per inch. And you might assume that if you want really high resolution printing, you should just get the highest mesh count screen you can find. And that's sort of true, but there's actually more going on here than you might think. The photosensitive layer actually has some thickness to it. I can actually catch my finger on the edge of this um, photosensitive material that we coated onto the screen. And the thing that actually determines the shape that you're going to print is in fact this layer. So basically what I'm saying is that this uh, photosensitive layer can partially occlude one of the openings in the screen. So the screen resolution is not really like a pixel count. Don't think of it like uh, digital imaging where if you have more pixels, that's great because your image won't be as pixelated. It really doesn't work that way. It's much more of an analog process, uh, especially because it's really the photosensitive layer that determines your ultimate resolution. Having said that, generally, yeah, you need to have a really fine support structure because the strength of this photosensitive layer is not that high. So if you have really fine details, you, you kind of need a fine screen, but don't think that it's like a one-to-one -one pixel relationship. When this process was first invented, the screens were all made of silk, hence the term silk screening. But all, it's all polyester these days, even though we still use the term silk screen in a lot of cases. Just keep in mind it's an antique term, even though everything is polyester now. You can buy polyester screen uh, on rolls and stretch it over a frame yourself, or you can buy these pre-stretched frames, which I would strongly recommend if you're getting started. Another thing you might find surprising is that these pre-stretched frames are all very large, like common sizes are like 20 by 30 inches about. And if you only want to print small stuff, you might think, well, I, you know, I don't need that. I only need a small frame like this. However, you can only use the central about 70% of the screen. Even this, this is about as close to the edge as you can get because in, in the process of printing, you actually have to stretch the screen. That's really a normal part of, of the printing process and you can't stretch the screen if you're printing all the way to the edge. So really it's important to uh, only use the center 70 or 80 percent of the screen. You'll also notice that some of the screens are white and some of them are yellow. What's the deal with that? The yellow is the dye that they add to the polyester that they call an anti-halation technique. And so if you want high resolution when we're shining ultraviolet light in here to expose the photopolymer, what we don't want to happen is the light to 
go through the layer and then bounce off of the white screen and then expose the neighboring areas. So the yellow dye basically absorbs the ultraviolet light so that we don't get reflections and hence lower resolution. Uh, you'll pretty much find that all of the screens above 200 or 250 uh, openings per inch automatically come stained yellow like this. And it's just a, the only reason that these are not yellow, that all screens aren't yellow, is just to save money. So in the lower resolution screens, it's white just to save money. One reason not to use the highest mesh count screen you can get is that it passes less ink than larger screens. So these two were printed, uh, same process, same artwork, same everything, but the uh, print on the right was made with the 350 count screen and the print on the left was made with the 250 count screen. And you can see that there's not quite as much coverage here, but I was able to do it here. So it's one of these things where the higher mesh count screen uh, is more uh, sensitive to technique and loading and the type of ink and the viscosity and everything. And so the reason that screens above 305 or 350 are super uncommon is because they're just more difficult to use. So you generally want to stick to the 250 to 300 range um, and you get more consistent results. Okay, so we've got our screen picked out. I happen to like 250 to 300 openings per inch and this is like an 11 by 17 inch pre-stretched frame um, that I've had pretty good luck with. So the next step is to coat this with the photosensitive layer. And traditionally this was done with something called a scoop coater. And what you do is pour this uh, photosensitive liquid into the scoop coater and then tip it up here and, and uh, distribute it onto the screen. And there's all kinds of different techniques, you know, from one side and then the other, and then you turn it around and wipe it again. And there's quite a bit of skill involved with managing the scoop coater, uh, depending how viscous your stuff is and how often you wipe it. And then you have to let it dry, of course, and the orientation in which the screen is held is important. Is it face down? Is it face up? It's this way. And to be honest, the whole thing is actually really difficult, and I don't recommend doing this. There's a much easier way. Uh, instead of pouring this liquid uh, photosensitive layer into the scoop coater, uh, they sell photo emulsion already in a sheet on like a plastic backing. And what we do is wet down the screen with some water and then unfurl this layer of photosensitive material onto the front of the screen. And then just quickly use a squeegee to uh, brush off the excess water and give it a little bit of pressure. The screen can be dried in any orientation and it will dry more quickly than this old fashioned liquid photo polymer. And um, you will have a much more consistent layer. So remember what I was saying with the resolution is a largely determined by the consistency of your photo polymer. And as you can imagine, trying to get like a perfectly, you know, within 10 micron consistent layer of stuff on there with this hand process, it's kind of iffy. So it's really much better to use a pre-made film uh, and just be done with it and you get this perfectly smooth photopolymer layer. Um, one thing is that there's about 10 or 15 different common kinds of photopolymer. This is called the emulsion in uh, screen printing lingo. And you'll be overwhelmed with the number of options available to you. Uh, there's a lot of terminology. Some of these are called diazo. Some of them are, who knows what else, um, dual action or whatever. Uh, in my experience, with, with, in my limited experience, it doesn't make as huge of a difference as you might think. Um, they're really sort of squeezing out the last bit of performance from a screen printing process. And if you're just getting started, pretty much any of them will work just to get your feet wet with the process. Uh, I'll, of course, put my uh, favorite list of things that worked for me in the uh, description. Well, it's true that all of these chemicals are photosensitive. You don't want to work in sunlight, of course. They're really not that sensitive. Don't think of them like photographic uh, papers or films. Your safe light conditions really don't have to be that amazing. And what I'm using is generally just a, um, an LED, like warm white LED bulb in my garage here and I don't cover the windows up or anything. It doesn't make any difference. Um, when you see later on the exposure times are on the order of like 10 minutes being full blasted by an ultraviolet lamp. And so a little bit of room light isn't going to hurt anything. Even like standard, you know, computer monitors spraying out a little stray light, it's no big deal. 
Um, however, if the uh, screen has to dry for a day or two even, that can't happen in the room because that's too many hours of exposure, even with a dim light. So you need to have somewhere dark to dry these things out. And I'm using this metal filing cabinet, and um, it's not ventilated, of course. So what I do is put all of the screens in the upper drawer and then open the lower drawer and aim a fan in there to get some uh, fresh air in. And the way the metal drawers are constructed, there's a pretty good light baffling. It's pretty cold and rainy here right now, so the drying times are quite long. Uh, I was noticing that it takes almost a full 24 hours for this green film to dry, and even longer for the pink um, liquid that I applied with the scoop coater. Again, I don't recommend doing that, but I was trying a whole bunch of different things out. While the screens are drying, you want to get your artwork ready for printing. And at first you might think you have to use transparencies like this, but this um, actually doesn't work that well because the ink doesn't stick to this smooth surface. A better solution is to use this translucent vellum paper. And um, you might think that it has to be transparent for the light to get through, but actually this passes more ultraviolet light than this clear plastic does. I've measured it myself. And um, so there's basically no reason you ever want to use a transparency like this. Just go with the thick vellum paper. You, you can use plain old tracing paper. The only downside is that it tends to jam in the printer. It will make little creases and wrinkles, and those will actually affect you in a, in a bad way. So the best thing that I've found is relatively thick and heavy uh, vellum paper. Regarding the printer itself, I'm using a 600 DPI laser printer. There's nothing too special about it. You can use an inkjet printer, of course, but don't be... Um, don't assume that that magic 4800 DPI number they always throw around really means anything. The black resolution of an uh, inkjet printer is probably 600 or maybe 1200, but probably not higher than that. And as you can imagine, the manufacturers really like to stretch the numbers as much as they can. So for the most part, 600 DPI is what you're going to be printing. Um, the main thing that you want to focus on is contrast. You really want the dark areas to be as absolutely dark as possible so that when you expose your uh, screen, you get the biggest contrast between the dark and the light areas. So if there's a density adjustment on your printing software, you want to crank it up as high as possible. Okay, so now that we've got our artwork printed and our screen coated with the photopolymer and dried, it's time to make the exposure. So I am using this ultraviolet light source, and uh, this works pretty well, but it's not ideal, which I'll explain why in a minute. Um, anyway, the way this works is to put the artwork uh, print side up, and then take the screen that has the photopolymer on this surface and put it face down. And this will, in fact, create a mirror image on there, but that's fine, because then when we print this back onto the substrate, it mirrors it again, so you end up with um, the correct image. And you know, if you don't have one of these ultraviolet light sources, it's no big deal. It's really just a bunch of fluorescent tubes inside there. And the tubes are, in fact, special, but they aren't that hard to get. Um, it's just uh, ultraviolet uh, fluorescent tubes, and so you could build one of these. But if you don't want to build one and don't have one, you can uh, actually use the sun itself. The sun is a great ultraviolet light source. And in that case, what you want to do is have a compliant backing like this cube of foam and put your screen on top of that and then the artwork face down onto the uh, photosensitive layer and then critically you have to use a piece of glass to force the the printed layer the artwork flat down onto the surface and you have to apply a lot of pressure I mean really build a, a fixture to hold this down um, by far the most critical part of the entire screen printing process is getting the artwork in really good contact with the photosensitive layer. Uh, if you want to capture details that are 100 microns or a couple hundred microns, if you're off the surface by a couple hundred microns, the shadow caused by that is going to swamp out your detail. Um, it really, this really is the most critical part of the whole process. The sunlight is pretty variable, of course, and so if you want to do this indoors with more repeatability, you can use a uh, mercury vapor or metal halide lamp. You can probably hack one out of an old computer projector uh, or just buy a mercury vapor lamp uh, from the hardware store if they still have them. 
Uh, but the point is that the, the nice thing about that sort of a light source is that it's basically a small, almost a point light source. And so if you set up the lamp four feet away from this setup, when the light shines down here, even if there is a slight air gap or whatever in there, the shadow will be very sharp. And so all of the really professional screen printing machines, in fact, do use metal halide or mercury vapor lamps for this reason. The problem with the fluorescent tubes is that the light is coming from this extended source, so that if there is a slight uh, gap between the artwork and the photosensitive layer, uh, it really will cause a much bigger problem. So to get around this, what I had been doing is putting this down here. You don't need a piece of glass for this method, of course, because the glass is already on the surface here. You put the artwork here, and then I put the foam layer here and put some weight on here. And I found out that I, I was using a drill press vise, and that was in fact not heavy enough. So I upgraded my weight so that this foam was really compressed down. Can't stress enough how important it is to make sure everything is super compressed together. If it isn't, you end up with problems like this, where you might think there was some other issue here, but the problem was that the um, edge contrast was lost because there was in fact a slight air gap. With this setup with the fluorescent tubes, my exposures were about 10 minutes for this setup. Uh, that includes the attenuation through that uh, translucent vellum paper and the sensitivity of the photopolymer and everything. When I was using that pink uh, photopolymer that I applied with the scoop coater, the exposure times were on the order of two minutes. So your exact setup, your exact chemicals, the attenuation of your um, paper that you're using or the transparency that you're using will all affect the exposure time. So it's kind of tough to give an exact value. Um, luckily, it's pretty easy to figure out. And also, if your exposure is 10 minutes, being plus or minus you know, 20 seconds doesn't make a big of a deal. So you don't need a timer or a fancy darkroom timer because these exposure times are so long. After the exposure is complete, you want to wash away all the parts of the photopolymer that were not cured by the UV light. And you still have to do this under, you know, quote, darkroom conditions. But um, I did it in my kitchen a few times and it's fine. Even with normal room lighting, it's not that big of a deal just because it isn't that sensitive and normal room lighting doesn't output that much UV light. Um, you can also do it uh, outdoors at dusk or something with a garden hose. That works fine too. You don't need a pressure washer to do this step at all, especially if you're using a film uh, emulsion that doesn't really soak into the mesh as much as the scoop coater method does. Um, later on, it's helpful to have a pressure washer to clean a screen that is very stubborn, uh, especially a screen that has been uh, used with these epoxy inks or epoxy paints that are very um, sticky and hard to get off. But the uh, clean out of the of the photopolymer layer is, is relatively easy. It's okay to use a brush to clean out stubborn areas and you might be surprised at how much of a manual process this is. Um, use cool water. You don't have to add anything to the water to, to uh, clean out the photopolymer, uh, but it is true that using a soft bristle brush uh, can make the process happen more quickly and also you can kind of focus on areas that need a little bit more cleaning. Now that the screen is washed out and dried, it's time to print. Uh, this process is pretty straightforward. The only thing to note is that the screen should not come down into contact with the substrate. That's a big problem. It, you have to suspend the screen above the substrate, and then when you come through with the squeegee, it actually pushes the screen down into momentary contact. Uh, this is super critical. If the screen is allowed to come into contact with the substrate for too long, the ink will wick out under the uh, covered areas on the screen and you'll end up with a, a really poor resolution image. Um, the standoff distance doesn't appear to be that critical. I was just using a couple pieces of maybe, you know, five or six millimeter thick acrylic. And um, as long as you can easily push the screen down without feeling like you're stressing anything, it's probably fine. The choice of ink, though, is another interesting uh, thing. The fact that you can use any ink you want with screen printing is one of its main benefits, right? I mean, you can use conductive inks or uh, electroluminescent inks or anything under the sun. But if you use a purpose-built uh, screen printing ink, you'll definitely get the best results. And again, if you're just starting out, it's kind of nice to start with something that works so well. One thing that was new to me was the use of these epoxy paints. So you can see here on the right, this is a black uh, two-part epoxy paint. 
and the performance is just absolutely incredible. You can see the density. These were all printed with the same screen, the same um, process, the same substrate glass. Um, this is sort of a medium quality black enamel and oil-based paint. This is actually an undiluted um, artist's oil paint. So this is not really the same thing because this is a carried in a solvent base. This is actually drying by oxidation, but it's very dense. But the epoxy paint is still better. It leaves a really nice finish. The adhesion is super high. The density is really nice. The only downside is that cleaning up this epoxy paint is a super nightmare. Um, there's a special cleaner that you can buy from the screen print places that will help you clean it up, but it's really a whole other level of pain. Like if you think that cleaning up oil-based paints is difficult, just wait until you clean up an epoxy-based paint. Um, the only reason you'd use them is because the performance is really that amazing. Once they're dried, they're solvent resistant and fade resistant. I mean, they're really, really nice paints. This cleaner is pretty aggressive, and if you let it set on the emulsion for too long, it will actually hurt the emulsion, so you have to be pretty quick at cleaning the ink out with this. If you're using an oil-based or a water-based paint, just use water or uh, naphtha to clean your screen. If you're using the epoxy-based paints, you pretty much have to use this, because I haven't seen anything else that will clean up those epoxy paints. When you're completely done with a design and want to print something else, it's not really economically feasible to throw the whole screen out, so then you use this chemical to loosen the emulsion and spray it away with a garden hoser in a sink. And this works pretty well. I've never had uh, much of a problem uh, getting rid of the film coating. Cleaning off the pink stuff that I applied with the scoop coater, again, was more difficult. So you save time on both the front and the back end when using this film process. And then as a final cleaning process after the emulsion has been removed, you can use this stain remover and degreaser, which is basically soapy water with maybe like pumice powder in it or something. It does roughen up the screen a little bit, which is great because that provides adhesion for the next emulsion you're gonna put on there. And the degreaser is important so that you get a nice clean sheet of water on there, uh, which helps the emulsion stick as well. So with everything I've shown in the video, you can easily get down to 400 or even 300 micron pitch. Uh, eight point font looks pretty good. Six point is marginal and anything less than that doesn't appear to work. And you can see with a side by side with the original artwork, my printer can print 200 micron pitch and uh, easily get down to uh, six point and maybe even four point font. So there's a little bit of loss going from the print to the, or from the printed artwork to the uh, screen printed, but um, with a little bit of tweaking and a little bit more care, I think you can actually make it as good as a laser print in terms of resolution. But anyway, the really st the strength of screen printing, of course, is that you don't have to use ink from a printer. You can use all these other weird things, and you can print on substrates that you could never feed through a printer. Anyway, I hope that was helpful, and uh, as always, feel free to put your questions in the comments. And I will see you next time. Bye.